Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So today on the podcast, we have Foster Ackerman Jr. to discuss his latest book, Hidden History of Horse Racing in Kentucky. Mr. Ackerman is a Lexington native and local lawyer. As a founding trustee of the Lexington History Museum, his enthusiasm for local history has produced several publications, including First United Methodist Church Bicentennial History, Poems of the Law, a 40-year collection of poetry, and his book, Historic Lexington, Heart of the Bluegrass. Currently, he is the president and chief historian for the Lexington History Museum. Welcome, Mr. Ackerman. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for coming. Your latest book on horse racing, what inspired you to write about that particular part of Kentucky's history? Well, actually, it was a process. The history press out of Charleston, South Carolina, found my history of Lexington and so knew that I was a local historian, and they contacted me. And over the period of about two months, we kicked five or six ideas around on what would fit their series of hidden histories. I first proposed the hidden history of bourbon because I thought I'd get to go into the back tasting rooms and, (laughs) you know, have a lot of fun that way. But they they can see in the stream of books coming out and said there are too many bourbon books coming. What actually landed this book was when we started talking about the African-American jockeys in the late 1800s, yes. post-emancipation, mm-hmm. and uh, they were really the first athlete class mm-hmm. in the United States and actually made NBA-level annual salaries and, and race payments wow, in, that's in, those term, in that, that day's money mm-hmm. following the racing circuit. Mm-hmm. And, and that interested my editors, and they said, okay, well, that's one chapter Let's mm-hmm. look at some other chapters, and we talk through what we thought would be interesting. And then, you know, I had the, the joy of going out to research it and look it up and okay. locate images for the book. All right. That sounds like a fun process. <laughs> well, it was, but it's one of those things, you know, you, you, there's always something more to learn. Mm-hmm. And I just had to have a cutoff date. Yeah. And once I turned over the manuscript to my editors and lost complete control over the whole thing, <laughs> I found six interesting things that I really wanted to include. No, but yeah. Too late. You know. Oh, well. <laughs> so how did racing begin here in Kentucky generally and then in Lexington specifically? Well, of course, racing started in Virginia. Mm-hmm. And in fact, racing was the national sport in the colonial period for a number of reasons. One, other sports had not been invented. And everybody had a horse or was willing to bet on a horse. <laughs> And because land was so expensive, they were not oval tracks to begin with. They were quarter-mile straight sprints and frequently two-horse matches Mm -hmm. where one guy would bet his horse against the other horse. So that's how racing started in Virginia. Of course, it came into Kentucky with everybody coming through the mountains and down the Ohio. In Lexington, it actually started on Main Street, and there was racing on Main Street, two-horse, three-horse match races. Mm -hmm. Even before some of the tree stumps were taken out, the board of trustees of the city of Lexington received a lot of complaints from the merchants and from people who attempted to walk down the street, and suddenly here would come a pair of horses flying through. And so they ultimately voted to ban what they called the pernicious practice of racing on Main Street. (laughs) And they, they sent it first to the town commons along town branch. That really wasn't satisfactory because that's where people exercised their horses for pleasure. It's where they walked, Mm -hmm. promenaded, if you want to use the the fancy English word for all that. It moved to a track on South Broadway from the crest of the hill between Maxwell and High Street down to Bolivar Street and Oliver Lewis Way today. But there was a creek that ran down there. Okay. So that if you race your horse down to the bottom of the creek, then you could water the horse at the end of the race. So that was convenient. (laughs) Uh, Ultimately, an oval track was formed up at the back of what is now the Lexington Cemetery, where it flattens out and into a residential subdivision. It was called the Williams Brothers Track. They owned the land, Mm -hmm. and it was fairly clear to begin with, so they didn't have a lot of trees to clear, and they laid out the track. Mm 
And that's where our first oval racing began in Lexington. Around 1812, I think, the property sold to somebody who didn't want the racing there. And the Kentucky Association for Racing was established in Lexington. Mm -hmm. And a track was cut at what is now 5th and Ray Street, East 5th and Ray Street, the northeast quadrant of town. The track ran in an angle to the northeast. Mm -hmm. The clubhouse was inside the city limits, (laughs) as was the finish line. But there was an ordinance against gambling. So the gambling sheds and the and the home stretch were outside the city limits. Okay. So you would walk out into the county to place your bet and then come and back, then into, back into, into the city to watch the <laughs> finish of the race. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, the Red Mile was the same way. Yes. When the, when the trotting track was put together out there, what we know now as Floral Hall or the Round Barn, the just round near barn the is, entrance mm-hmm. to the track. Yeah. That was in the county, mm-hmm. but the clubhouse was in the city. Okay. So all of the bookies set up in Floral Hall to okay. to uh, place bets. So you would walk over to the round barn to place your bet and then walk back over to watch the race. There's always a way around it. That's right. Gambling. gambling. Yeah. In fact, I think it would be very interesting to know, and, and we never can unless some catch of, of private correspondence shows up. What negotiations went on to set up the one mile from the courthouse yeah. radius to establish the city limit. Mm-hmm. And somebody say, well, let's do a mile and a half. I well, can't do that. That's going to hit the betting shed. We need to pull it back to a mile, <laughs> you know, but we'll keep the finish line. Yeah. Just to make it, it legal. Just yeah. to make it legal. And, and, and the city can tax the track just a little bit, you know. There must have been some interesting politics going on. <laughs> I'm sure. That. I'm sure it was. So horse owners and trainers take great pride in their jockey silks. It's an identifying feature of the horse and the jockey, of course, during a race. So can you tell us a little bit about how these silks came to be and what they mean for both the horse owner and the spectator? I found that chapter in your book very Well, thank you. The, the, um, of course, for the owner, it's a brand. It's like Pepsi mm-hmm. or Coca-Cola. Yes. It's your farm. Mm-hmm. The practice of associating colors with horses in a race actually started in ancient Persia Mm -hmm. and in China, where frequently companies of cavalry would dress in similar colored, so you could tell where your unit was. Mm -hmm. By the 600s BC, Greek riders would ride into the racing area with different colored cloaks or capes, and then they would drop those capes at the race. What we would recognize as the first true jockey silks appeared when Henry VIII was racing in 1515, and he wanted to distinguish the king's horses from everybody else's. And of course, fashion being what it is, once the king adopted a set of colors, then of course the dukes had to have their colors. And it it got out of hand over the next 200 years. And there were conflicting patterns and colors. And so the English Jockey Club in 1762 called a meeting 19 titled gentlemen arrived, Mm -hmm. and they agreed that there would be a limited number of colors and a limited number of geometric shapes. Mm -hmm. And 19 gentlemen then registered colors at that meeting in Newmarket, England. The Duke of Cumberland, for whom Cumberland Gap and the Cumberland River are named, chose purple. The Duke of Devonshire chose straw color. Mm -hmm. He didn't say yellow. He said straw. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Duke of Grafton was sky blue. At first, all caps were black But after a while, they started to share the colors and change colors. And Lexington's Jockey Club was founded in 1826. Henry Clay was a founding member of the Lexington Jockey Club. He was actually a better horse breeder than he was a politician. (laughs) And the rules in Lexington required that all riders had to wear silk jackets and silk caps, but it did not maintain a registry of colors and, and silk patterns. Later on, the racetrack authority in New York State started what became the American or U.S. Jockey Club's Mm -hmm. uh, registration. By around 1900, the riders at the trotting tracks picked up on the idea. And of course, they have jackets, long coats, instead of a tight jacket like a thoroughbred jockey, but they started adopting colors and patterns and registering them too. Mm -hmm. Two interesting things. In Great Britain today, there are over 15,000 individual silks Silks. registered. And the Queen, Queen Elizabeth's silks are purple and scarlet with gold trim, Mm -hmm. and her cap has fringe on it. And the reason you haven't seen anybody with fringe riding at Keeneland is because only the Queen can have fringe. Oh, okay. 
That's how you know, again, just like Henry, yeah. these are the crown's horses mm -hmm. versus everybody else. They have to be unique. Yes. As Union soldiers battled with Confederate soldiers during the Civil War, racing continued. Yes. It did not stop. As control over the region kind of oscillated back and forth between North and South, how did racing organizers continue with horse racing? The first thing that, to answer that is to, to ask what region you're talking about, mm -hmm. because in the Deep South, all the tracks closed. Yeah. And all the horses and everybody went to war. Yeah. So you'd have good thoroughbreds pulling cannon and mm -hmm. pulling supply wagons. Working. Working horses. Yeah. Now, the cavalry officers would try to get the best horses and all of that, but frequently the cavalry uh, riders just had their own horse, mm -hmm. you know, which they used at the farm and civilian life. In the north, of course, there were not as many tracks, but that, with only two exceptions, there were no battles fought in what we think of as the north, mm -hmm. so those tracks were generally unaffected. Some suspended operations for the war for obvious reasons. Yeah. Lexington being Lexington, we just kind of ignored the Civil War <laughs> for much. purposes of racing. Mm -hmm. Breeding continued, racing continued unaffected. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there was a spring meet in 1863 where it was shortened from four days to three days because the Confederates were approaching and, yeah. and everybody just kind of backed up a little bit. Mm -hmm. In August of 1863, the Battle of Richmond was fought. The Confederates won. 200,000 Confederates occupied Lexington. Mm -hmm. And think about that for a moment. We had 10,000 residents yeah. in Lexington. Mm -hmm. 200,000 soldiers and cavalry occupied Lexington, ran out the Union Army. That was late August. In October of 63, the Union Army came back in full force and ran the Confederates out of Lexington, and ran them ultimately out of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. But the fall meet at that time was held in September. And sure enough, racing, three days of racing continued. And Lexington is the only place in the country where thoroughbred racing was conducted under the Confederate flag. And you know that the officers who were stationed, who pulled up down at the Phoenix Hotel, and, and the cavalry all went out to the races to watch the races. To, to watch the races, yeah. sure. Yeah. You know, why not? That's what you do. <laughs> because it's Lexington. Because it's Lexington. <laughs> racing continue. The history of horse racing in Kentucky is predominantly known for Churchill Downs and the Kentucky Derby. How was Churchill Downs established? Churchill Downs was established as a, a factor of pure jealousy. As all things start. <laughs> Many. If it doesn't involve money, it involves jealousy of or course. women. There had been tracks in Jefferson County. Uh -huh. But by 1870, there were none. And the only serious racing going on was going on in Lexington. And the horsemen in the Louisville area wanted a track to come back. And so they organized themselves, and they picked a, a prominent businessman who knew nothing about racing, but he was a smart businessman. And they said, go figure this out. We want a track. We're tired of traveling to Lexington. So he took a year off and went to Europe and studied the major tracks in England and France mm -hmm. and, and got the business model and brought that back to Louisville. They rented land initially from the Churchill family, which is how the name came about, mm -hmm. and established a new track, Churchill Downs, in Louisville. One thing that I talk about in the book is when the Earl of Derby, spelled as we would say at Derby, actually visited the Kentucky Derby in 1935. His ancestor, the Earl of Derby, was having a, a party at his country estate. Mm -hmm. And when I say country estate, think Downton Abbey, you know, as opposed to the townhouse in London. And he and the other horsemen were lamenting the fact there was no good race for fillies. So they decided to have one at the local track, and that was great success. And they called that, after the name of the country estate, they called it the Oaks. Oh. And the next year, they were reveling in their success and said, well, we need to have a race for two-year-olds. And the Earl of Derby and the Duke, who was the head of the jockey club, were both there. They were the ranking nobles. And so it was, according to story, a coin toss as to who that race would be named after. <laughs> and it was named after Lord Derby. Okay. So the first Oaks and the first Derby were private races in the English countryside. And the French copied it, and the Italians copied The Russians had a Derby. Poles had a Derby, the Warsaw Derby. And they all had Oaks. 
And so when this Louisvillian went over there, he saw, well, this was the big deal. If you had a big stakes race for fillies and a big stakes race for two-year-olds, that would attract the horses. And so that's where our derby and our Kentucky Oaks originated. Where were the earliest racetracks here in Lexington? You spoke earlier about some of the the racetracks that started on Main Street and then on South Broadway. Well, we had the ones I've talked about on Main Street and Town Commons and Mm -hmm. South Broadway, the Williams Brothers track. Mm -hmm. Once the Kentucky Association track was established, that was pretty much the main track until it was uh, forced out of business with the Great Depression. It closed in 1932. The horsemen organized, got with Mr. Keene, and in 1936 opened up Keeneland. But that's thoroughbred. There there were some other tracks. Uh, If you are familiar with the location of the West side, west of Limestone, part of the UK Med Center at Leader and Herald and Gazette Avenues. There was a a standard bred trotting track between Waller Avenue and Virginia Avenue, Limestone and the railroad tracks. And that was a very popular track in uh, post-Civil War days until that gentleman died. His sons didn't have any interest and uh, subsequently developed it into residential lots. There were a lot of private training tracks. Henry Clay had a track at Ashland, kind of behind where the old Shriners Hospital is. The backstretch would have run behind Cassidy and Morton schools and turned around shortly past that Mm -hmm. and come back down. One of the more interesting tracks is Richmond Road. The city line stopped at roughly at Ashland Avenue. So you were out in the country. And Henry Clay McDowell, the last of the family to live at Ashland, loved to drive carriages. And, of course, the road to Richmond ran right beside the farm. Mm -hmm. But it was a public road. He worked out a deal with Colonel Preston on the other side of Richmond Road and bought 50 feet of land from Colonel Preston and built an incoming track. And so he would ride out of Ashland, out of the gate at Ashland and onto Richmond Road and race down Richmond Road, turn around, come back down the other side and finish in front of his house. And he would invite friends to have races. And in fact, There is a a granite marker in the median where Sycamore Road crosses, honoring the H.C. McDowell Speedway. Oh, I never noticed that. And, you know, NASCAR Speedways is what we talk about now, but the term Speedway was applied to four-wheel carriage racing. And so when the horses were internalized as combustion engines, Mm -hmm. the name stuck. Yeah. So you're racing cars instead of carriages. Well, that's one of the more interesting, and that's why there are medians down Richmond Road. Yeah. And ultimately, the other side was declared a public way, and the county took responsibility for maintaining it. Mm. But there were there, there are stories you can read in the in old newspapers where people complained to the city government because the horsemen who were getting out early in the morning to practice along Richmond Road were raising too much dust, and the city wasn't watering down the yeah. dirt road yeah. enough to keep the dust down. I'm always complaining about those horse so, races. Yeah, well, that's right. That's right. <laughs> So you have a section in your book about some forgotten horse farms in and around Lexington. Can you share some of the stories for our podcast listeners about some of those farms? For those who have been around Lexington 67 years like I have, we've watched the horse farms become subdivisions. But for someone who is recent to Lexington, there are many, many former horse farms that are now subdivisions. Mm -hmm. Merrick Place, for example, on the Taste Creek Road, the old farmhouse is now the Merrick Inn restaurant. Now, that was the farmhouse. And the famous stallion Merrick is, in fact, buried just beside the valet's hut in front of the restaurant. But that, that whole area, all of those houses and apartments and condos back in that area, that was the Merrick Farm, and that was a major thoroughbred farm. Just over New Circle Road is the Gainesway subdivision. Mm-hmm. And John Gaines' father raised standard breads out there. John, the son, and he's been dead about 15, 20 years, changed over to thoroughbreds. But that was a major breeding and racing farm. And when John decided to sell it, the original idea for Gainesway was as an equine subdivision. Mm. They were going to retain the pond on the farm as a fishing site. They were going to retain the barns. They were going to put riding trails all the way through. And the idea was if you bought a lot, you got the right to use a stall. And that turned out not to have a market. A lot of what was to be the equestrian area is now the Taste Creek Golf Course. Yeah. 
Is that where the high, the schools are as well? Where the schools are. There is a pond in that area. Is that the pond that you were talking yes. about? Or, okay. Yes, yes. That's yeah. that, all of the Tastery School campus, the golf course, mm -hmm. and inside almost to New Circle Road. Obviously, New Circle Road did not obey boundary lines when that right-of-way was cut yes. through. So part of Merrick is on one side of New Circle, and part of Gaines is on the other side and back and forth. An interesting one for those who travel South Broadway was Ingleside Farm. There is a commercial office building, kind of across from what used to be the Winn-Dixie Shopping Center area. It has what looks like castle battlements along the top of it. There's a picture of it in the book. And their office is in there now, but that originally was the gatehouse to Ingleside Farm. And the gatekeeper and his wife lived there. And the arched middle section of that building went all the way to the ground. There's steps up now, but it went all the way to the ground and carriages would pull up and have to seek entry through the gate. And that was that was interesting because Ingleside was a standard bread farm and it abuts the Red Mile property. So you didn't even have to go out on Broadway to take your horses to the Red Mile. You could open the fence, go through the gate. Was Sunny Slope a horse farm or is it just a I, I do not know that, but I wouldn't be surprised yeah. because the soil, we've all heard this, the limestone in the water and in the grass is good for horses' bones. This was recognized early and so almost everything outside of the original city limits was equine. Yeah. We had very, very little, very, very little corn was grown. Tobacco did not become a dominant crop until much later yeah. after the horse farms were established. Mm -hmm. A lot of corn was grown out Winchester Road because the soil character changes there and it's not as good for thoroughbreds, but it's good enough for corn. But all of Hamburg Place, whether it's the shopping center or the business offices, mm -hmm or the residential areas, the Hamburg farm, you know, it started out at 600 acres and grew to over 2,000 acres. So it was a, and there's still more on the other side of the interstate that hasn't been developed yet. So as I mentioned in the introduction, you are the president of the Lexington History Museum. Can you tell us a little bit about what projects you are working on personally and through the museum and what the future of the Lexington History Museum is? Well, as you know, we had to leave the old courthouse because of environmental issues eight years ago. And for about five years, we went through the seven stages of grief and trying to decide, you know, what are we going to do if we don't have a big exhibit hall? Yeah. And we've now figured out that you actually can do your job without a 5,000 square foot hall. We're still looking for one, mm -hmm. but we're not out of business. Yeah. We've refined our mission statement down to we tell Lexington's story to everybody every way. So, for example... I'm now doing an audio discussion of Lexington history. We're working with uh, director and producer Doug High, who did the Bell Breezing documentary two years yes. ago. Mm -hmm. We're working on a video history of Lexington and Kentucky that will air on KET. Okay. It's done magazine style, like 60 minutes. So you might have four or five stories in an hour. And we're doing them in the show in order to make it varied and interesting. We're mixing up different time periods and people and events. But it will be possible to disassemble those shows and put them back together in chronological order. And if we can keep this up for about 10 programs, then we will be able to tell 250 years of Lexington's history sequentially, put it on Blu-ray, get it into the schools, get it out to others who are interested in viewing it. I tell people that our three-year-old grandson, Michael, is not going to learn Lexington history reading my book. <laughs> At least not until he's 50 and whatever passes for television has nothing on that night and he pulls it off the shelf. But he will watch an eight-minute video section. So if I can get these little segments and we'll get the two citizens earlier to teach them about Lexington history. We're working on those projects. We have an exhibit up on the 20th anniversary of the Fairness Ordinance down at the Public Library in July. We will be having an exhibit in January 2020 at the Downtown Arts Center on the history of the bench and bar. July 2020, we will have a, an exhibit on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. That one's going to be I've discovered an interesting little piece of White House history on the horses owned by presidents. And I am working with the White House Historical Society to see what they have on that that they might lend us. Okay for an exhibit. So wh what I'm saying is and even after we get a, a big exhibit hall for a more permanent display, we'll continue to do two exhibits a year. Yeah. We'll be on television, we'll be on radio, mm -hmm. 
We will be reprinting little history tidbits of Lexington, 20 pages, 30 pages, too small for a publisher to want, but they're out of print. So we've started the Lexington History Press, and we're going to bring them back. So we've got a lot going on, okay. even though it's not the way we traditionally started. It doesn't matter if you don't have brick or mortar, but as long as you're keeping the history alive for, for Lexingtonians and for visitors of Lexington. You mentioned visitors. My publisher, the History Press, has contracted with me and another local historian, Peter Brackney, and we are working on the History Lover's Guide to Lexington and Central Kentucky. That would be awesome. Yeah, we we had Mr. Brackney on the podcast previously, and he's well, a You need to have Peter and I together. We're a great duet. <laughs> this, There's an idea. We're, we're hoping this will come out before Breeders' Cup in the fall of 2020 when all those people come to Lexington. Mm -hmm. This will be something else for them to do when they're not out at the races. Yeah. The chapter that, that is my favorite in draft right now is what's outside my hotel window. Wow. So that when you get up in the morning, uh -huh. if you are on the south side of the Hyatt, uh -huh. then you're looking down South Broadway, you're looking at Pleasant Green Church, mm -hmm. you're looking where the racetrack used to be, but you see something completely different if you're on the north side of the hotel. Yeah. You're looking at Victorian Square and the Western Suburb Historic District, and of course, Triangle Park. Your view from 21C is going to be different. Your view from the Hilton is going to be different. Your view from the Marriott is going to be. So that little chapter will, will just say, here are six things that you can see out your window. Go to the chapter on those to find out more detail. That is a creative way to share Lexington's history. Well, I'm, I, and I'm hoping the hotels will, you know, put of copies course. in everybody's room. Yes. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Thank you again, Mr. Ackerman, for, for joining us. Well, it was a pleasure being here, Miriam. Thank you. Foster Ackerman's latest book is Hidden History of Horse Racing in Kentucky. It's available for checkout at the Lexington Public Library. And for purchase, check your local bookstore or online. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm, or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at lex. X-P-U-B-L-I-B dot org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.